This afternoon, we will be hearing five panelists sharing about their alcohol, alcohol harm reduction programming on their campuses. Each student will have about eight minutes to share their initiative or initiatives. Please hold your questions until the end of all the presentations where you can direct your questions to a specific panelist or the whole panel. Those of you watching on the live stream, please write your comments in the comments section of the stream and we will be sure to read your questions to the panel at the end. I also invite you to share your alcohol harm programming that takes place on your campus. Our first panelist will be Kate Morrison. She's a second year medical student at, and the president of the Student Medical Society of Saskatchewan. And she will be sharing with us alcohol harm reduction programs developed within the College of Medicine. Hi everyone, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm just gonna figure out and hello to everyone on the live stream. So I'm just gonna be talking a little bit about um, the wristband or the yellow wristband and what this means um, for the College of Medicine and, and our student society. So as part of my role as president of the student society, I help oversee and coordinate our welcome week activities, um, which are often um, a big topic of harm reduction. Um, so one of the, uh, kind of just go through an outline here. So. Our Medical Student Welcome Week is a week that we have in August when we're all kicking things off to invite our first year class and kind of get let, let them get to know each other as well as get to know the upper years. Um, and so there's Welcome Week along with, I think what I've seen across Canada is there's a lot of traditions involved with Welcome Week, which make it for a very hard thing to adapt with as our society learns more about um, substance use and things like that. So it becomes a challenge to change things and to change people's mind. And that was something that we wanted to tackle a bit, um, myself and my whole uh, committee who is organizing this. So this really became uh, something that we approached kind of with a lens of culture change and, and knowing that it wasn't going to be sort of a quick change and something that we weren't gonna accomplish everything this year, but that we could make some changes. Um, and we knew that with culture change that, that took a lot of uh, buy-in from both the upper years who had sort of seen how things had been done before, um, as well as kind of enough time so that we could um, just let them know what, what we were doing and make sure that they all were on the same page and, and, and could help us coordinate this because this, um, the way our main event, the one that we're kind of the most concerned about, um, has a lot of history and a lot of, it also basically um, necessitates everyone to buy into it or else it won't work because it coordinates with so many upper years um, helping with the event. So typically our event is something that starts usually on campus and we separate our first year class into different groups. It's voluntary to attend, but it's sort of, I don't know, voluntary, but you're a first year and you're probably highly, you're very highly encouraged to come and there's a lot of that social uh, stress for students to decide whether they're gonna come, especially if it's something that they're not super comfortable with normally to attend these types of events. Um, and basically we have historically marketed the event as you must come, we really hope you come, and we're not telling you anything about the event. That was sort of the history of the event. So that scares a lot of people and uh, sparks a lot of anxiety for quite a few people. So this year we took an approach where we basically said, we didn't tell them a lot, but we just said, you won't have to drink if you don't want to. Um, there will be alcohol, just so you know. And we're gonna be starting here, you'll be fed dinner, you'll be basically fed and watered and taken care of as long as you trust your second year. So there was a bit of, um, second years and some of the up years, but it's mostly a second year event who help. So we typically separate groups based on um, how we're kind of going to transport people to different um, event stations, I should say. And we separated groups historically on just giving them a wristband. And so we thought, what could we do that would help us signify who wasn't drinking without it being a whole uh, conversation every single time asking if you're drinking and kind of just bringing it up all the time. Um, and so what we decided to do was that we would have another wristband um, that would identify and we would educate our upper years on what that wristband signified that would say these people aren't drinking or they were drinking and they've now been determined that they are no longer drinking because they've had enough and they don't get to decide that all the time. That's sometimes just an upper year saying, yep, I think you've had enough for tonight and you now get this wristband. But the way that we got buy-in from the first year class was that we also make this night kind of a scavenger hunt. And so there's points 
where they win no prize at the end and that's our little gag to them. But they don't know that and so the, I'm sharing my secrets with everyone now, but this is typically what we do. And so um, we said that the, this yellow wristband was worth quite a few points. Um, I can't, let's say 500 points. And we didn't tell them why they were getting it, but you would just be awarded it by the upper year. So if you were starting your night out and saying, yeah, I'm not planning on drinking tonight, the upper year sort of in that next couple minutes would be like, oh, you get a yellow wristband. And so everyone was sort of, there was a cohort of people that were getting this yellow wristband at the beginning of the night. And then as the night went on and people were maybe having one, two, three, many drinks, or getting to that line where it was kind of clear that they had had enough for the night and could switch to maybe some pop, soda, whatever, um, then they would also get a yellow wristband. And so that was our way to signal to all of our colleagues just to not even ask. It's, it's not a question. Um, but the cool side effect of this was that um, it also was a, a physical sign of how many people weren't drinking, at least at the beginning of the night, which was really impactful for educating my fellow classmates on just how many people choose not to drink. Um, so that was kind of a side effect that we didn't know was going to happen originally. Um, and it was really neat as I was going from different station to station and talking to sort of the people in my class who go out and drink all the time, and that's not all, I shouldn't say all the time, but they are the people in our class going out on the weekend and having a good time, and that's how they spend their time, and that's great. Um, but they said, oh, Kate, I didn't know that, you know, this many people, and we don't have enough games for people who don't want to have shots, and we don't want to, I was like, yeah, we, that's next year's problem. We're going to fix that too. That's a great point. So it really became a way of us to for us to see how many people just select for whatever reason that we don't need to know not to drink. Um, so I'm just going to share, I got some feedback from some of the first years and second years, mostly first years, that I'm just going to share. So the, I kind of talked about the first one. The second one here was a student who was choosing not to drink that night um, and so said, I did enjoy the night. I had a really uh, hard time deciding if I wanted to go, and in the end, I'm glad I did. What I enjoyed most was getting to meet and spend time with my new classmates. I did not feel pressure to consume alcohol, and no one questioned my decision. The wristbands we wore to signify we weren't drinking worked well. They found out later that that's what it meant. That's how they know. Um, so the other one was someone, this is another person choosing not to drink, but said, most activities were geared towards people who were drinking, so it'd be nice to have some alternate activities uh, for people who weren't who weren't drinking alcohol. And so this was our big takeaway, and this is kind of what we're excited to work on next year and, and something that we learned by just having a physical sign of how many people weren't drinking. Um, this was a student who did choose to drink alcohol and said, at no point in the evening did I feel pressure to drink. Um, in their response also said, although I was drinking, but never felt the pressure to kind of continue with that. Um, and I said, and said, I also did not see anyone getting pressured to drink. Uh, my only real complaint for the night was how difficult it was to find a beer. So much emphasis on shot after shot, beer gives people who might want to drink but pace themselves a little more of an opportunity to participate in that aspect while being able to retain more control over their intake. So that was something that we also thought was interesting um, to learn, A, because we actually asked for feedback, which I think is something that isn't always done with these events, so we learned from that, um, and also kind of allowed us to see we're not only worried about the people who aren't drinking, but we're worried about the people who are drinking, but also don't want to be consuming shots and kind of in this uncontrolled environment of maybe how much alcohol am I consuming. So the beer, was that's something we've now learned as well, is just offering a variety of things so that people can consume alcohol in a way that they want. And this event is unique in that the first year class is not supplying their own alcohol, so it is really um, contingent on the type of alcohol we supply to them. So um, just a few other thoughts in terms of if anyone was thinking of any type of change like this for a kind of event that has a lot of tradition, is that we had quite a bit of um, pushback from some of our upper year colleagues just about even this change in general, saying things like kind of me having to shut down the event earlier in the night because I was done. We were done with the night. It didn't need to kind of continue on forever. Um, and, and just also before this, we sent out documents and documents with what the night was going to be, what our expectations were of our colleagues, and why this was important. Um, and it was still really incredible to see how many people weren't buying into it originally or who felt the need to say, why are you doing this? Why are you changing this? So um, although we've gotten lots of positive feedback since then, I think it is it does take a group of people who are kind of willing to take that flack to make this change and to sort of see the need for it. Um, and I think it is there, but I, I would definitely share that it was not a welcome with open arms change. And the other main takeaway um, is that 
a lot of these events that we have as student societies that we organize, we often dissociate ourselves from the college um, because you know it's not exactly our most attractive and professional evenings. And I think that's very well understood. But we've also are often told, don't speak with your college about this, don't interact with them. And I think it's such a negative thing because we're all we all are professionals. We're all able. People are consuming alcohol as they want. And what allowed us by actually speaking openly with our college about this was to seek the necessary funding to have food to have other drink options that weren't alcohol, to have things. Our college didn't pay for the alcohol. That was student funded. That was all there. But they were able to help us accommodate the other types of fees that allowed us to have a safe night. And I think having that open conversation and realizing that people drink and that's OK, but that that still requires some safety and some support from your network was, was hugely beneficial. So that's sort of my quick overview. I hope I haven't went over my time. Thanks. <laughs> Actually, Kate, if you want to come back. Um, Kate, unfortunately, has to leave right away. So if there are any questions for her about her presentation, you can direct them to her now. Thank you. Sure, I think one of the obvious questions is, thank you very much for this great initiative. I'd be happy to provide support within the college if I can in my, my capacity on faculty. But the question I have is, what was the intent? If, if this tradition is to have them play shot games, you would think the intent is for them to get drunk. Is, is that the Yeah, purpose? good question. So yeah, historically, this was called our initiation night. Um, we are now not calling it that, or I'm hoping that that name goes away. Not because we don't want to initiate people and make our first year colleagues feel a bit silly. That's kind of, I think, something that happens a lot in these professional col colleges. But um, I think we are moving more towards an intent where the purpose is for us to the first year class to get to know each other and the second year class to get to know them in a way that allows us to kind of like like today, I was in clinic, I'm in my blazer. Not show up like that, not to have that, those barriers and just to have a bit of fun. And it, with some alcohol if you want, but the getting them belligerently drunk just wasn't serving any of us, I don't think, yeah. Right, I, I would think so. You know, if you kind of deconstruct that a little bit, it actually puts the new students in a, in a poor light and it actually puts them at risk, so. It, and I think it puts the current students in a poor light as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so clarifying the goal is, is probably helpful. And, and you're quite right, a lot of soci student societies inherit these things. They feel that they have to maintain their tradition and, and stepping back and looking at it more, more critically and with a different lens and things have changed uh, is, is good. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I just had a question. We, we've been talking quite a bit this morning about um, peer-led initiatives. To, to what extent do you think there might be a possibility, you know, maybe starting at the University of Saskatchewan, where this could actually become something quite standard for, for student groups to do? I know we're going to hear from the student union this afternoon a little bit. Um, where, where might you see something like that going? Because I guess if the administration says, hey, we have this great scheme, everybody do this, nobody's doing it. Yeah. Um, how, how would you see maybe sort of the next steps for, for you maybe about be beginning to be able to share this with some student leadership and talk about the value for you and, 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 and the, I guess even the recognition from your own group that things have changed? Yeah, I think a part of it, and I think you're right in saying that the universe, like if it came from the university's wor words, it may not, the buy-in, and I think that is so important, would not be there. And I think it's one of the roles that for students thinking about getting into student leadership positions, part of your role is to stay connected to your class and be able to engage them and to challenge them and say we can be better than what we are now and so I think if that was something that students want to want to see in their own student societies even if it was more of a catalyst project of we just work more collaboratively I know we have some people from the USSU here our, our, our um, undergraduate student society here and if we just were chatting more and it became more of an organic thing that students were doing first, I think there would probably, it would take longer, but I think it would be more effective in the long run because I don't think people like listening to kind of all the time some big initiatives. Unfortunately, it would be great because it'd be a lot faster, but a lot of this was me speaking to people on individual levels, speaking to our whole, like saying, don't leave this mandatory class we had, I have to talk to you for five minutes. And, you know, saying blatantly, like we had students who had terrible experiences last year. This is not, these are your classmates who are sitting beside you. We can't have this happen again. And, and that is so much more impactful than just saying like, oh, you know, put this on and don't drink. Like there's some people who aren't drinking because I think 
um, yeah, it's, it's hard if you can't kind of feel that impact yourself. So I don't know though, I'm not sure what the best option would be. No, I, I think it's just trying to get into that space where there is something cool about collective responsibility and that people understand it. We're not doing it because of scare tactics about what you might be responsible for if things go wrong, if, if there is that. And I, I know we've, we've done a lot of work at the university, particularly around the bystander intervention program around collective responsibility around uh, sexual violence prevention. So yeah. I feel like if it's just something simple but student-led, I think it could have legs. So yeah, I think it's yeah. fantastic, well, well done. Thank you, and I, I think just off of what you were saying, even with the sexual violence, is that was one of the things we used with our colleagues, and especially we're in medicine, and we talk about all the time about consent and the importance of consent, and I said to my colleagues, I said, we speak about consent for sexual, sexual consent all the time, and that applies to alcohol consumption, that applies to everything. So if you don't have someone's consent for them to consume alcohol, you are crossing a line that, you, like in our professional college, and for anyone, is just completely unacceptable. And, and trying to say that and, and to expect more of your colleagues, I think, instead of sort of, um, yeah, in, in, instead of accepting substandard uh, character, like who you are, is it helps and it's, you kind of just have to push people, but they respond. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Kate, for sharing your initiative with us. I think it's really admirable for you to have put yourself out there in front of your other colleagues, as you say, and to stand up for those students and their health and as well as the students who choose not to drink. Thank you again. Next up, I'd like to invite um, Melissa Wilson. Melissa is the student staff coordinator at the U of S uh, Peer Health for the What's Your Cap program um, that we heard a little bit about this morning from Dr. Colleen Dell. Melissa is in her second year of university studying microbiology and immu immunology. Pardon me. Thank you, Melissa. Hi guys, um, I'm just going to do a quick run through about what your cap is as well as um, where it came from just in case anyone, um, closer, okay, is that better? Great. Um, I'm just going to move that. Great. Just in case anyone missed from the earlier session, um, so what's your cap? Um, we are a student-run, so peer-to-peer research-based initiative with the goal of raising awareness and knowledge of the risks involved with the overconsumption of alcohol by promoting a culture a culture of moderation on the University of Saskatchewan campus. Um, we consist of student staff and volunteers through the Peer Health Mentors Program, as well as an advisory committee um, made up of faculty and staff. Um, What's Your Cap started out um, of a sociology and studies and addictions course. Um, students were asked to build a project around something they perceived to be a problem on campus. And the 2012 class designed empirically based binge drinking prevention campaigns. From there, um, research about U of S students drinking behaviors, any associated problems and possible solutions was done. Um, and they found a need to focus on individual choice. And this informed our campaign slogan, what's your cap, as well as the tagline, no one to put a lid on drinking. Great, sorry. Okay. Um, What's Your Cap strives to reduce alcohol-related harms through peer-run and engaging events with educational components. So these include um, sharing and encouraging students to follow the low-risk drinking guidelines. And this is done through trivia questions, infographics, presentations, as well as swag um, with the guidelines explained. And there's never an event that we do where we don't speak to these low-risk drinking guidelines. Um, we also promote our think and drink tips. Um, which can be easily implemented by students. Um, these are easy to digest harm reduction tips that students can easily implement for safer drinking. Um, these range from the basics, so like eat a good meal before you plan on drinking, um, and being aware of portion distortion um, to U of S specific tips. Um, for example, downloading the SGI Safe Ride app for all of your ride options. Um, we also share relevant information on alcohol-related issues so that students can make well-informed decisions about their drinking. Um, these often follow campus current events as well as the pulse of student life. Um, so for example, uh, most recently with the legalization of cannabis, we've collaborated with uh, Mary Ellen um, to have some joint presentations as well as um, infographics and other useful materials. In response, some of our, sorry, in response, some of our alcohol harm reduction events include um, the therapy dogs. Um, What's our cap is a partner with the pause or stress therapy dogs. And this has provided um, students a healthy way to relieve their stress. 
Um, we also do tunnel events. So at these events, we bring out our uh, display boards that have information on alcohol consumption and how to do it safer. Um, we do residence events where we are often asked um, to attend, like the toga run, where we give out free mocktails as well as information to students um, while encouraging them to be safe if they choose to consume alcohol. And then we often do partnered events um, like our International Student uh, Centre collaboration. Um, we do several campaigns like Thinking About My Drinking, Party Smart, It's Potty Time. And when planning our events, um, like I said before, we have to follow the student life. So for example, our Thinking About My Drinking is planned for every January because this is when students are planning their year, their goal setting, and they're learning from the mistakes of the previous term. And then in contrast, events around mental health and stress, we try to do those around exam season because that is when students are most interested in them. Um, and then of course we do presentations kind of like this one. Um, thinking about my drinking, I cannot take credit for this one this year. Graham did, has done an awesome job um, facilitating that and making sure it runs smoothly. Um, this is our, typically our biggest campaign of the year, um, where What's Your Cap encourages students to stay dry for a weekend, a week, or the month of January, and then reflect on how this affected their life, both socially, academically, and financially. And then we ask them to document their experience in blog posts. And these, posts were then, these posts were then used as an entry into a draw to win some awesome prizes. Um, we typically send themes, e themed emails every week um, to participants with motivational quotes, mocktail recipes, as well as other resources. So like a financial calculator during our finances week, a calorie calculator um, during um, our uh, fitness week. Students um, being able to choose the length of their challenge is new to the campaign, and our goal was to make the challenge more appealing to students who do regularly drink, um, as well as offer several opportunities for students to join the challenge. Um, we typically have around 20 to 25 students who enter officially, as in they give us at least three um, blog posts back. Um, however, we typically have at least twice that many who sign up, so it's kind of hard to tell how many are unofficially um, joining the event. And this is just the image we use for our promotional material for thinking about my drinking for the past two years. Um, and this was really important that we keep the message positive because we want this to be a positive opportunity for students to reflect and improve their relationship with alcohol and not guilt students into abstinence. The main method of promotion for this event is usually social media, um, like Facebook, Instagram, pause bulletins. Um, but we also do posters throughout the campus. And because we use quotes from this event in other campaigns and presentations, we're essentially talking about this event year-round and encourage students to participate as well. Um, and this is a great harm reduction initiative because it embodies our peer-to-peer -peer philosophy. Um, actual U of S students document their experiences being sober at popular events like the mock wedding. They're being critical of the culture um, of consumption on our campus, as well as prioritizing other aspects of student life other than alcohol. The purpose of this event is to collect quotes from U of S students and gain insight into students' experiences both with and without alcohol, which we then use to post for other students to see, and this serves as additional promotion for Thinking About My Drinking, as well as support for other students who may be having a similar experience. Um, it also provides greater insight into student issues we need to develop res um, resources on as well as address. Um, and because this event um, encourages them to share their personal experiences, um, we do get submissions applicable to several related um, issues um, like drinking and driving, social influence, financial consequences, spiritual connection, and physical and mental health. And this is a submission from Thinking About My Drinking 2019, which has just ended. And I think the student does a great job of summarizing their personal experience at the U of S and the pressures they have felt on campus. And while this may not be every student's experience, there's definitely an issue with the um, perception that entire college or campus's culture is so consumed by alcohol. And my favorite part about this one is where she says, um, our whole thing is to drink hard and party harder, and most people's attitude towards this is some weird pride rather than seeing it as a problem. I think a large part of this stems from the majority of this particular college um, being from small towns, which is a whole other issue on its own. Ever since the first day I set foot on this campus, I felt the societal pressure to drink. Parties in VP and CQ every night before you were 19, counting down the days until you were, then beer and wing nights, egg nights, Prayland events, winter mixers and other egg events. The list is endless. It's such a huge part of college culture in general, not just in this particular college, um, that it's become ingrained in everyone's mentality. And this challenge has definitely made me consider this more than I previously have. And I think this is why we need to dispel the culture of consumption on campus and continue creating that culture of moderation. 
Another harm reduction initiative is partnering with residents to provide alcohol education in a fun and inviting medium. Um, What's Your Cap was invited to provide games for residents, students prior to the residence toga run, um, we brought our giant solo cup game, which you can see at the back if you are here in person, um, giant Jenga, as well as our blood alcohol concentration info board. And because students at this event were almost exclusively 21 and under, the goal of this event was to educate students on blood alcohol concentration and ask, what is 0.08 for you, as well as educate them on the updated driving under the influence laws. And we know from our NCHA data that 31% of U of S students reported driving after consuming alcohol, and which with our new DOI laws is illegal for many of these students. And this event was a success because we had increased engagement from last year, as well as we had really great conversations with students um, who indicated that they do regularly binge drink. Um, we updated um, our Django questions so that they included the lowest drinking guidelines. They were really easily digestible for students and attractive to students who do um, legitimately like to drink. Um, and many students actually mentioned how their perception of what 0.08 was much higher than the um, Mothers Against Dr Drunk Driving estimates, which were provided at the event. And most people have heard of that 0.08, but have no real understanding of what that number means. Um, and every student who participated in the event left knowing that even a single drink can increase your uh, blood alcohol concentration, even if they do not necessarily feel intoxicated. Um, some of the students were actually quite open about drinking and driving and indicated that driving after what they identified as a few drinks was really common among their peers and even themselves, um, with a few commenting how they were lucky that they had never gotten a DUI, which is of course concerning and why we need to continue doing these sort of um, events. Um, and it was a great opportunity to directly connect with these students who engage in these high-risk behaviors and give them information and resources to hopefully make better decisions. And this is just an event we participated in with the U of S residents two nights ago, and it was actually inspired by the game I mentioned before, which I'm gonna talk about super briefly here. So last year we made giant solo cups by painting red garbage cans, and these have provided us with a new game as well as a passive display to talk about the lowest drinking guidelines and portion distortion. On these it says one ounce of liquor, but they're being updated um, pretty soon here to include one and a half so that they reflect the actual lowest drinking guidelines now. Um, our giant solo cup game was a great way to attract students, as well as capitalize on their connection to the popular drinking game, which of course is beer pong, um, and then translate this into an opportunity to share our harm reduction messaging, so like our think and drink tips, the lowest drinking guidelines, et cetera. And because of our um, solo cup game's resemblance to beer pong, it's really important that we keep the messaging of the event constant and not let it be corrupted, of course, by that association. Um, and we did this by incorporating educational components whenever possible. So before students were allowed to play, we'd have to ask them what 0 0.08 would look like for them. And in order to get that number, they would have to look at our display board. Um, and luckily, every single student who came in actually ended up doing that. Um, incorporating trivia questions into the game and capitalizing on students' reactions as well. So surprise at the difficulty of the game and tying this back to alcohol's effect on the central nervous system, on hand-eye coordination, balance, and judgment. Another harm reduction goal is to encourage students to think about their priorities while being a U of S student. The perception on campus is that 97% of students drink and that, men, and that um, university life is equivalent to a partying life. Um, party Smart is a month long event with games, presentations, safe drinking tips, as well as Party Smart pledges. And this event typically takes place in October because students are still adjusting to the social context of so, um, of university life. They're attending drinking events and many are transitioning into midterm preparation. And the goal of this event is to increase awareness of alcohol related harms by encouraging students to pledge to party smart and prioritize their wellness and academic responsibilities over alcohol. Students are encouraged to sign a responsible partying pledge, um, which can be anything like, I pledge to watch out for my friends. I pledge to always have a designated non-drinking driver. Um, I pledge that studying will come before drinking. And then students um, receive a purple party pledge, um, rubber bracelet for pledging. Um, other swag is also given out, including our Party Smart checklist, which guides students through planning and executing a safe night with alcohol. And this event in particular, was a success because it actually inspired peer health volunteers to implement harm reduction strategies from the event into their own lives in addition to students unaffiliated with peer health across the campus. So it's always great when you can have someone come back and tell you these harm reduction strategies really worked for me and I was able to implement them into my everyday life as a student, as someone on the U of S campus. Then, 
Um, Party Smart Month is divided into four themed weeks. So my body focuses obviously on the physiological and biological components. Um, my money focuses on ticket and social costs related to alcohol. My academics, of course, on how alcohol impedes study and sleep. And mocktails are usually provided during this week um, to students throughout the month and to, to demonstrate alternative fun to drinking alcohol. And my social life focuses on how alcohol affects students' social responsibilities and connections with others. And this event is also really successful in that it's a great opportunity to partner with other organizations. Um, so for example, in the past, we've worked with the Aboriginal Student Centre, Campus Communications, um, University Housing, University of Saskatchewan Students Union as well. And another big campaign is focused a lot around awareness, um, specifically using um, our toilets um, with a form of guerrilla marketing. Seven toilets are dispersed around the U of S campus, each with their own uniquely decorative theme and messaging. The messaging focused around What's Her Cap's main message of no one to put a lid on drinking. Um, with the it's hashtag It's Potty Time campaign, theme of asking students at the end of the night, where would you want to be? Um, students are encouraged to take pictures with the toilets and take What's Her Cap with the hashtag It's Potty Time. And the number of students reached for this last time it was done in 2013-2014 um, was a little bit difficult to determine due to low usage of the hashtag, um, which made it difficult to then find the photos. Um, but we do hope that our increased presence on Instagram will positively influence the number of students who use um, the hashtag in the future. And this is just some promotional material from the event. And the toilets are a great promotional tool and they can be used to pique student interest and open the conversation on harm reduction um, strategies in conjunction with other events and campaigns as well. So they're kind of dual usage. Um, for example, last year they were used to promote thinking about my drinking, um, which allowed our physical promotional material to be di distributed more widely across the campus. So instead of just being a poster in a sea of a whole bunch of similar looking posters, it actually got to stand out and we had more surface area as well. Um, and that is the end of what I have, but that's just a little bit of what we've been doing to um, share these uh, harm reduction strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And just a reminder that we're going to hold all questions until the end of the panelists. Um, I've had the pleasure of being able to work in the same space as What's Your Cap for the past two and a half years and have been able to take part in some of these programmings that she talked about, specifically thinking about my drinking, which was just this past month and is a lot harder than you think it would be. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite Aaron Fraunberger. He's a PhD candidate in neuroscience at the University of Calgary, specializing in pediatric traumatic brain injury. Specifically, he takes a closer look at the mitochondria and how metabolism programs the immune response in the brain following injury. Outside of the lab, Eric is active in the graduate student community as president of the Hotchkiss Brain Institute trainee organization and keeps the University of Calgary, Calgary campus safe as the training director of the University of Calgary student medical response team. If I can have Eric come up, thank you. Can everyone hear me at the back? We're good? Okay. Great. So you already heard the introduction, so you know my name is Eric. I'm going to give you a brief overview today of our student medical response team and then our past room initiative, which is linked to PEPA. So I won't go through the slide word for word, but I'm mainly here today in my capacity as the co-director of training for the student medical response team. So you can see here in the photo, I'm also standing with our other co-director of training, Claire Hines, who's a primary care paramedic in Alberta. So to give you a little bit of background for, of a, about our response team, it was founded in 2014, and as you can see from this table, we have many different students with different levels of response capabilities, and they're also from varying faculties and departments. So you can see here we have medical students, nursing students, paramedics, first responders, lifeguards, but we also take just any student who's interested in joining and wants to learn some life-saving skills. Now, currently, we're able to operate on the University of Calgary campus at the primary care paramedic scope of practice, which means we can initiate IVs, do four lead ECGs, upper airway adjuncts, and we can also administer up to 10 different drugs, depending on the medical condition that we encounter. 
to keep everyone up to snuff. We also do yearly medical first responder training to get any members who join the team you know, up to par to be able to perform life-saving interventions on campus. And we also do monthly scenario and training nights to make sure that everyone's knowledge and skills are kept up. As you can see here, there's a couple of different photos from our training nights. One here uh, is from our medical first responder class a couple of years ago where we had live patients. We break out all the regular equipment that we use on a, an actual call. And we do try and go all out when we get the makeup. We try to get our responders to have that kind of oh crap moment when they're in training. So that way when they go out and actually have to respond to something that could involve a gross injury, they're ready for it. And this is just a sample of some of our call statistics. So you get an idea of where we're coming from on campus. Now out of 150 calls that I sampled from our database, you can see here that about 40% of them are related to injury, but one fifth are related to intoxication. So that could be related to alcohol or drugs. Uh, we're working on making that a separation right now. Uh, and then one fifth are related to illness. So this could be anything from abdominal pain to just not feeling well. And the remaining fifth are due to uh, psychological conditions, medical conditions, or overdoses. And then outside of campus response, we're also very active in collaborating with different community organizations. So here in the top left, you'll see that we're collaborating with Calgary Fire Department to work on extricating someone from a vehicle to show that we're able to work with them in the event of a major emergency on campus. And the same thing goes for down here on the bottom left, where we have a few of our responders and our members working with the Calgary Police Department during an active shooter simulation on campus. And then up here, this is us during our Bermuda Shorts Day, which is a giant party day on campus at the end of the year to celebrate the end of the school year. And that's a EMS, um, it's a large van from Edmonton where we can treat up to six patients at once and we can triage people. And in the top right here, it's a little bit of shameless self-promotion. We do participate in the St. John's Ambulance first aid competition every year. In the last couple of years, we managed to take home top awards. So like I said, shameless self-promotion. So now you're probably thinking, how does this have to involve with alcohol or PAPA? Well, we neatly fit into strategic area number two, which is health services. So we provide some emergency medical response on campus and have a good dialogue going with Calgary EMS to make sure that anyone who is intoxicated gets the appropriate care and is safe. And then as you'll see quickly uh, in the next couple slides, that we also offer interventions such as brief motivational interviewing to students who may be intoxicated uh, from alcohol or having issues with substance abuse. So an example of a call that we might get on campus related to alcohol could be something like we have an 18-year-old male who's unconscious in the washroom outside of the den, which is our campus bar. Now there's a little bit of an algorithm here to follow on how we assess people, but essentially, if there's any kind of major issue, we call EMS and we keep them alive long enough to get taken to the hospital by EMS. Now if we, we notice that there's no major injuries or medical emergencies, then we take some vitals, we get a history, and if we find out that it's just isolated alcohol and or cannabis use, we refer them to our pass room which I'll talk about in the next slide. However, if there's any kind of complicating factors, so they take multiple drugs, or we think they might be under the influence of multiple substances, or they've hit their head or something like that, then they go to uh, the emergency department. So this brings me to our key initiative here, which is the PASS room. It stands for uh, Post-Alcohol Support Space. And the idea behind this post-alcohol support space is to make sure that there's a safe and judgment-free environment where students can go if they've had a little too much to drink, or they've had a little too much cannabis. You can see here from the clever advertisements, people really do take advantage of this room. Uh, the criteria for our admission at our pass room is they can only be under the influence of alcohol and or cannabis, so no other complicating injuries or drugs. They have to be verbal and mobile, so they have to be able to walk around and tell us about their history and what they've taken. And they also have to have not other, any other kind of major injuries, because that complicates things quite a bit. And what this is really doing is it's eliminating the need for us to call EMS all the time for people who have just had a little too much to drink or who have had a little too much cannabis. But it's also taking the pressure off of roommates, significant others, or uh, residence assistants to supervise the people who have had a little too much to drink or too much cannabis. So just to give you a couple of details about the past room, in the last semester, some statistics, we had about one to two students per week, and notably on Thursdays because that's when we have our campus bar night. The majority of the students are based in residence. So when they're, uh, they're admitted to the pass room, of course we figure out if they're students on, living on campus, living off campus, or not students at all, but we don't exclude based on that. A lot of the admissions are related to alcohol, as the name would suggest, but since cannabis has become legalized, it's become a lot more, uh, well, we've had a lot more cannabis-related admissions. 
Uh, and just alone in 2018, we've avoided 11 EMS calls. So typically what would happen before this room was in place is people would have a little too much to drink or take a little too much cannabis, and they would be found unconscious or they'd be found not uh, doing so well. And of course, EMS would get called and they would take the person to the hospital and they'd be at the hospital tying up resources where they don't really need to be using those resources. So that's where we would come in. And so this is an example of someone who's admitted to the past room in the fall semester. So a 19-year-old male was found who had a little too much uh, marijuana in the form of edibles, and he was feeling out of control. So the problem we found with him is that he ate some, didn't feel anything, ate more, didn't feel anything, and then it hit him all at once. And so they call campus security, and we work very closely with campus security as a medical response team to respond to calls to make sure that everyone remains safe. We escorted them to the pass room around 10.40 in the evening, and they had food and fluids provided. So in the past room, we do provide electrolyte drinks, granola bars, some light food, as well as beds and medical supervision to make sure that the person is safe and they do recover properly. And then once the person feels that they're well enough to leave, they're escorted back to the room by campus security. So that's it. If you have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And if you need to contact, if you're interested about the team in a little more detail, there's the team's email. Or if you're interested in contacting me about any of the initiatives that we have going on with the past room or otherwise, there's my email down there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Our next panelist is Owen Black. He is the Western Regional Rep for PEPA, as well as the Vice President External for the University of Manitoba Student Union. He will be speaking to, he will be speaking to how student groups mitigate the harms of alcohol on the University of Manitoba's campuses. Owen was unfortunately unable to be here today, but I am told that he is watching us via live stream. Um, in his place, we have a video that is going to be played. Hey everyone, my name is Owen Black and I'm the Western Regional Rep for PEPA um, and I'm also the Vice President External for the University of Manitoba Students Union. Um, so today in my presentation I'm going to touch upon three sort of methods and ways that student groups here on campus and associations and um, other sort of organizations uh, use to tackle the harms of alcohol and how to minimize um, sort of binge drinking and the effects of that. So. Okay, so I'll just start on the drinking culture at the University of Manitoba to give everyone a context about why we do what we do, um, at least from a student perspective. So the University of Manitoba has roughly 24,000 undergraduate students, which is actually about 66% of all undergraduates in the province of Manitoba. Um, I think if you look at the number of people that are at the University of Manitoba um, on a day-to-day -day basis, it, if University of Manitoba was a city, it would be the second largest city in Manitoba. So just sort of to give some context of actually how large in terms of within Manitoba the U, uh, the U of M is. Um, of these 24,000 students, 17% uh, are actually international students. So we do have a very diverse group of individuals on campus. Um, and about 1,400 students live on uh, in residence. Um, well, despite sort of the large number of resident students, U of M is primarily a commuter campus. Um, a lot of students bus, a lot of students drive. Um, so in terms of the drinking culture, it's students often, uh, at least aside from residents, coming to campus on Friday and Saturday nights um, for socials. And uh, so that's how the drinking culture is translated with the community uh, commuter campus. Students are coming back to, to school for socials and events and often aren't, they usually don't have a permanent residence on campus. Uh, so I'll be sort of using the term socials a lot. I've been told this is a Manitoba thing, so I thought I would just sort of describe it. Um, socials are often sort of, if you sort of think of a bar um, where you pay $10 to get in and then there'll be a bar and then music and you can get dance to it, except socials won't happen at a bar. Typically they'll, sort of you'll rent a space um, you'll bring in uh, like bartenders you'll bring in a DJ and then you'll then sort of have a big party within this space um, they're often used as fundraisers specifically for wedding socials uh, but in terms of the university context um, these large events can swell to sort of 900 people sometimes all 
um, in one room sort of partying to a DJ or sometimes a band. Um, and so that's sort of unique in a sense. I'm, at least that's what I've been told. Maybe your universities have this as well, but I just want to give you some context on what I'm referring to when I say socials. Um, and socials are the primary, like the primary uh, drinking events that happen on campus. Um, so these would happen on Friday and Saturday nights. Um, so for example, the Engineering Students Association last week hosted what they call the big one. Um, so they rent out our multi-purpose room, which uh, the capacity is about 900 people. And then usually they'll sell out tickets for $10, $15 and then hire a DJ and then everyone will just sort of party within that space. And then uh, what they often do is then the, the organizers will actually hire um, organizations or uh, request the presence of sort of like St. John's Ambulance um, to manage these huge crowds since it is roughly 900 people, 900 people potentially all intoxicated, different levels. Um, so I'll sort of touch upon those three specific methods that U of M student associations and faculties use, um, starting with Red Frogs. So Red Frogs is a student group under um, UMSU, which is the University of Manitoba Students Union, and that is primarily a peer-to-peer -peer service um, that will set up booths inside or outside the entrance and exits of the social and provide what they call hydration stations which is where teams of students, all volunteers, hand out free food and water, um, a staple is glazed donuts and popcorn, um, and they'll often be sort of the second eyes um, in terms of making sure everyone gets home safe. Um, so it's they're, they're great in the sense that you'll, you'll actually have students within, they'll be like in the party and they'll walk around with trays of water and like donuts um, which is really helpful, especially at the end of the night when everyone's sort of getting up to leave or winding down and they're there to provide refreshments and harm mitigating factors like water and um, food as well. Um, they're also, I was talking to the organizer and she says they're often called the best friends you never know you needed. Um, they're actually a global organization with about 45 volunteers at U of M and the organizer said they do a minimum of 18 events. And they've actually become sort of a staple at socials. Everyone sort of expects to see them. Um, lots of organizers, it's a no brainer to have them. Um, and they work in tandem with security to keep a second eye on people that are vulnerable. And they often offer, they often offer a safe space, either outside the social or within the social to, so if someone is super intoxicated, they can come sit down um, and relax and just sort of recover for a bit. And since it is a global uh, organization, I actually would recommend reaching out to potentially the organization to see if there is a group on campus at your campus. Um, we find that they're really helpful. And like I said earlier, it's a no brainer when we're having a social to have them at ours. Uh, the next or group that we often turn to is I'm sure uh, maybe other people are familiar with this, is the St. John's Ambulance. Um, they provide volunteer medical first responders. Um, they often work with Red Frogs, and I know they work great together. Um, and they're to be the first on the scene and the first to respond um, in critical moments until more, helps more help arrives. Um, this is sort of, I view it as if someone's extremely drunk and they need to be taken to the hospital, they're perfect there to, they're trained to sort of do the intake um, and at socials when you have 900 people that's sort of just assume that's going to happen despite uh, the re that's that's the reality despite the fact that we'd rather not have uh, really drunk individuals um, but it's great to have trained uh, professionals there to sort of guide everyone through the right process and to make sure that everyone's safe at the end of the night um, and they often have a booth outside or inside the event as well um, and then sort of the last uh, specialized technique that we've started recently doing is specialized wristbands. Um, so typically when people will hand in a ticket, they'll get a wristband, so then they can leave the social, say to go to the bathroom and then come back in. Um, a bunch of these wristbands often have uh, contact numbers printed on them for quick and easy access to resources. Um, examples that 
some of ours have used are uh, our security services direct phone numbers. Um, since security services on campus, that would be faster than calling 911, um, such as the clinic sexual assault crisis line um, and then Manitoba suicide hotlines. I do think there's always room for improvement and maybe numbers for cab companies or and if anyone else sort of has any ideas on what else to add, uh, we think that they're sort of a unique tool in the sense it's right there on your wrist. You can just literally look at it. Um, even if somebody finds you or you're really lost and you need help, you sort of have it right there on your wrist. Even if you say you have lost your phone and are looking for looking to borrow someone else's phone. Um, and we have found these sort of as a really cool tool to sort of improve safety and mitigate the harms. And so that's it from me. Um, I'd love to hear if you, anyone has any questions. I will be paying attention all day on the live stream. Um, and just give me a shout if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Owen. Our final panelist is Brent Kobis. He is the vice president of the US, U of S Student Union and has developed a alcohol harm awareness program for ratified student groups. Brent. Thank, thank you, everyone. So my name is Brian Kobus. I'm the Vice President of Operations and Finance here at the USSU. So under my portfolio at the University of Saskatchewan Students Union, I deal with liaisoning with transit, internal accountabilities, uh, but additionally, I also work with the 150 plus ratified campus groups. So before I want to get started, I just wanted to note for, for the audience that these are autonomous groups that I have, I have no control over. But each one of these groups has many different events that they do. So one of the ways that I wanted to sort of help with these groups is to try to jump ahead of them so that they can start preparing for those events to be safe, to reduce risk, and, you know, still have fun. Um, just while my slideshow comes up, I'll kind of try to do a little bit of things from memory. So I developed two different programs. So the first program, they're kind of complementary to each other. So the first side of it is a governance training structure where I go through Robert's Rules of Order. I provide them some templates on how to, um, uh, how to create minutes and do those sorts of things. But on the other side, I created some liability training um, to try to talk to groups about risk, about, oh, there we go, okay. See, I'm a natural up here. Uh, so, so yeah, this is slide already covered. So when it comes down to these two different services, I provide weekly sessions that I've advertised throughout the plasma screens on campus as well as through postering. And these are, I, I provide weekly drop-in sessions that groups can come in and there's sort of a pre-booked space where you can come in and you can join and uh, I just go through the content there. As well as I allow campus groups to come directly to me uh, and then I go through my slides there and I have conversation with them. Um, I have continued, the success rate for the drop-in sessions hasn't been the greatest, if I'm going to be totally honest with you. Um, it's usually during a time period around the lunchtime, because that was what I thought would be a good time for, for groups to come in, but the success rate, success rate hasn't been the greatest uh, over the last few months, but, the, but reaching out directly to campus groups has had a very, uh, very strong success rate. So I, I kind of went, talked a little bit about the governance training, uh, but in line with uh, sort of the symposium today, we also do a little bit of, uh, of event planning uh, scenarios and, and some of those things there. But it's really in the liability training that I wanted to discuss with you tonight, today. So we, we talk about event planning, we talk about duty of care. So duty of care is that you as a person who is the, an executive member of your group and your group as a whole has uh, something called social host responsibility. So when you host an event, you take on the responsibility of all the patrons that are there. And therefore, if alcohol is at your event, there's an increased risk that you take up. Um, so from, after I explain what duty of care is to the students there, I talk a little bit about overconsumption, I talk about sexual assault prevention, I talk about cannabis, 
and then we finally finish off uh, the conversation by talking about insurance and how, to, how the USSU can provide you with some insurance. With each one of these items that I've listed on here, I've actually take directly from the language of the university and peer health and, and these other initiatives because I think it is important that we kind of parrot the language over and over again because if you, know, if you have one source saying something and another source saying something else, if we can just kind of keep, keep, it, keep it on track, that's a good way to go. As well as by parroting the university's language, I'm able to keep my, my, my presentations concise and link up to resources that can provide students with further information. Because one of the things that I think that we as, as, uh, uh, as leaders and administrators on campus do is we kind of overwhelm students with information all of the time. And eventually, things just kind of go in one year and come out the other. So by providing them with concise information, but then links to follow up, it allows them to sort of specialize their knowledge, but also start that conversation within their group. Um, so I, I already went with that, connecting to other resources. And I also, a part of it is also acknowledging that, that I, uh, I actually have an elected position. I am not a specialist on, on these items. And by allowing groups to, by, by allowing students to know that there are experts on campus to help them out, it kind of can further enhance that conversation. And then when it comes down to the actual sale of insurance is probably where my, um, where, where my office does the most when it comes to actual reducing of the risk beyond sort of starting that conversation. So uh, amongst items that I, I go through with the group when they're trying to get their insurance to make sure they have covered is that they're having, they have security and they have tickets for their event. That there's proper servers with serve it right, which is required here in Saskatchewan. That their facilities are proper and they're not just having a house party at some, some lot in the city. Uh, that there's non-alcoholic beverages that are being served that there's appropriate quantities of alcohol. So if you have 50 people at, if you have 15 people at a party, you're not having an excessive amount of, of liquor, which, and that there's food. All of which is, all of which goes towards the proposal of trying to reduce your risk and reduce consumption of alcohol. And I just, as a kind of a final note, um, with the liability training that I, you can always contact me and I can go through the actual program with you. But one of the things that I've consistently done is you need to consistently reach out to what the university administration is doing to see what they're updating of their, their, uh, their languages. And additionally, um, as we go, go into our second cycle of these training programs, I've decided that I need to rebrand it a little bit. So unfortunately, liability training might be an interesting conversation for us to have here. Uh, but for most students, the, a word like liability doesn't even ring a bell of what, why it would be important to them. And usually they don't understand what duty of care is even. So uh, if you are looking to do a similar program as me, I would recommend rebranding re it as I plan to do as I move into my second cycle to something as, as, as mundane as Campus Clubs 101 or 102. Uh, and that way we can continue moving forward with this conversation. So where my, my focus is at this symposium is to building that conversation with his student groups to try to tackle the culture that this is normal uh, so that they have that conversation. So thanks so much. Thank you very much, Brent. And I'd just like to extend a thank you to all of our panelists again. Um, next up, we would like to address some of the responses that we've received from other universities about their own alcohol harms program. Uh, first is going to be a presentation from the University of Manitoba about their Red Frogs program, um, which is, was spoken to briefly by Owen. And My name is Britt Harvey. I'm the health and wellness educator at the University of Manitoba. And my name is Ailish Henry. I'm the health and wellness program assistant. So we're going to talk about two programs here on campus that focus on moderating the effects of alcohol and serve to promote harm reduction strategies as well as education and prevention. Healthy U is a peer-based health education program that trains student volunteers to educate their peers on topics such as sexual health, mental health, and substance use. There's a lengthy training process for students to join Healthy U. Healthy U holds drop-in office hours where students can chat with a peer health educator one-on-one. -on -one. They also hold events and outreach activities throughout the year on a variety of health-related topics. Red Frogs is a peer-based support program for young people aimed at reducing the harms of alcohol and other substances. 
It's run by Segway, a faith-based student group on campus. Red Frogs was a program that originated in Australia in the late 90s as a response to the need for friendly, peer-supported events where binge drinking was occurring. Red Frogs provide a positive peer presence in alcohol-fueled environments where young people gather. Red Frogs are trained to provide support to intoxicated students. They provide nutrition, water, diversion activities, and a safe space to go during events. Red Frogs are also trained on spotting predatory party behavior and intervening in at-risk situations. Healthy You volunteers are trained on substance use from a harm reduction approach in regards to alcohol, which is promoted through certain outreach activities. The Pour Me a Drink activity on campus was a way to introduce the concept of standard drinking guidelines in a fun and interactive way. Students were encouraged to pour themselves what they usually would for an alcoholic beverage, and this was compared to a standard drink serving was. An alcohol workshop provided on campus also focused on how to lower your risks if you choose to drink and empowering those who choose not to drink. Red Frogs can be booked at events by the University of Manitoba Students Union or any student group on campus. They provide hydration and food and support to intoxicated students. If students are found to be intoxicated, they're invited to sit down in the tent. Uh, they can phone someone if they need to be taken home. Red Frogs also coordinate with security and any medical staff present if they believe the student needs medical attention. They provide early detection and prevention techniques in regards to sexual assault. At some events, Red Frogs have staffed an alcohol-free zone for students. Healthy U volunteers are able to share accurate information in a welcoming and non-judgmental way. Students have mentioned that they appreciate the creative and fun way in which information is shared. Students have been very willing to share information about themselves with our volunteers and have been overall quite receptive to their health messages regarding harm reduction. Red Frogs use opportunities at events for education around reducing harms when necessary and appropriate. Thanks for listening to us. And now we have a presentation from the University of Lethbridge. We would now like to show you a video from the University of Lethbridge Alcohol and Drug Awareness Committee. It's a well-made video developed by the University of Lethbridge students that addresses alcohol harms, peer pressure, and low-risk drinking guidelines. Jan Driver, the Addictions and Wellness Coordinator at the University of Lethbridge, has also provided some information on how the video is used and how it was developed. The video is used to complement many alcohol awareness initiatives on campus, such as RA training, new student orientation, housing orientation, athletics alcohol awareness programs, ULSU clubs alcohol awareness programs, campaigns during no known high-risk drinking in the post-secondary populations, such as Halloween, St. Patrick's Day, and last class, class bash. The video was created with the support of local and provincial addiction prevention experts, as well as our students. It was important that the video did not convey scare tactics, as we know these do not work. We also engaged the students who volunteered their time to create the video in portraying what their peers could relate to and what would hook them into watching the entire video. The students advocated for their own language, example, puke and rally, and their own perceptions, as special occasions are very different for the post-secondary population compared to other adult populations in our society. <laughs> I'm slowing down. I'm drinking beer. Ah.
all over the place. I couldn't. <sighs> you can rally, bud. Hey man, you don't look so good. How about we call it a night, hey? Screw off, I'm fine. You think you're better than me? Always telling me what I should do? Just back off. Whatever man, I was just trying to help, okay? I don't need this. Dude, dude, wake up. Your phone's been going off like crazy. <clears throat> Didn't you have a meeting with a prof this morning? Uh, what time is it? Almost 11 a.m. I just got back from class, and you woke me up when you came in last night. You were a mess. Plus, you stepped on my laptop. You owe me one. Oh man, I don't even know how I got here. I'm sorry. Whatever, I'm going to the library. You woke me up when you came in last night. You were a mess. Back off. Whatever, man. I was just trying to help, okay? I don't need this. Plus, you stepped on my laptop. You owe me one. Oh, man. I don't even know how I got here. Hey man, are you all right? You look like you could use some help. Are you here with anyone? Yeah. Hey, does anybody know this guy? Oh yeah. You're not looking so great, man. How about we get you home, yeah? Here, have my water bottle, man. Thanks. Nothing to see here, guys. Give him some space. Want me to take you back to your place, Joe? All right, I'll get you some water. I'll take care of you. Hey guys, we're not allowed to play any drinking games in here. I don't want to have to report you, so let's just chill and have a good time. <laughs> nah man, I'm pacing myself. <laughs> gotta make this night last. I've got a lot of important stuff to do tomorrow, so I need to be on my A game. I will take another piece of that pizza though. <laughs> Thank you to the University of Manitoba and the University of Lethbridge for providing those materials for us. I was just speaking with Graham, he was one of the organizers of this event, and he was saying that when he was trying to find some materials, he couldn't find any videos that addressed uh, drinking on campus in the way that this uh, University of Lethbridge video had. So I really commend um, the creators of this video for addressing those issues in such a great way. <laughs> 